Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's extra session of the EV Journal Club. This is an event that's being done in collaboration with Web EV Talk. Um, and so we have here today Dolores DeVizio of Web EV Talk, who's going to help me with co moderating. Uh, we're going to have a discussion session at the end of the presentations today. So please uh, prepare yourselves for that. I hope many of you can stick around for it. Uh, so the way that we're going to do this today, because this is a special session, something that we haven't done before, um, we're going to have a brief introduction by me, yours truly, um, on the ancient history of microRNAs, uh, mostly in the cell. Uh, then we're going to hear from Manuel Albanese. So Manuel is the, um, is the first author of the recent preprint that's being presented today. And then after his presentation, we'll hear from Michiel Pechtel, who will talk, um, uh, maybe give a bit of a rebuttal or a different perspective on things. And then finally, we will have a moderated discussion with Dolores DeVizio um, and, and me trying to lead that discussion. So what I would ask you all to please do, uh, because you're muted right now, and we will keep everyone muted um, for convenience until the discussion session, I'd like to ask you to use the chat function, which you can find, um, it's usually at the bottom of your screen, there'll be a little bar, um, and there's a, a message icon there that says chat. You can enter your comments or your questions into the chat box, and Dolores and I, um, and members of my team will try to uh, compile those questions, um, get them into thematic categories, um, and make sure that we address as much as possible um, of the diversity of opinion and the, um, and the questions that are out there. So um, I would like to start with just showing a few slides um, that are, are gonna give us a little bit of a background um, on this topic um, and on uh, microRNAs in general. Um, so I would first like to, um, to, well, of course, thank everybody for joining today. And I hope that everyone can see my screen. Um, this is the, this is an event that we've, um, the, the EV Journal Club is something that we've been doing for several weeks now, um, actually since about mid-March. Um, we started out as an in-person meeting at Johns Hopkins about four years ago, but during the COVID shutdown, we decided to take this virtual, and I think we've had a, a really good response from folks. So thank you all for joining today. Um, I do want to mention that we have an event coming up on Wednesday, so this is our regular session. We usually have our events on Wednesdays. Um, at 12 noon Eastern time um, or um, um, uh, 1800 in, in, in Central Europe. Um, and so we're gonna have a, a great event on Wednesday on mem membrane binding peptides and how you can use these to capture EVs generally um, and to characterize EVs. So please, uh, please stay tuned for this one as well. Um, and I'd also like to, um, to tell you about Web EV Talk. So many of you know Web EV Talk it's been running for around the same amount of time as, as this journal club. Um, and it features um, an EV expert um, every few days giving a talk on their research. Um, so, so typically this is done on, um, on Thursdays uh, on a time that's convenient for both Europe and Asia Pacific. Um, and then on a time that's convenient for the Americas or Asia Pacific on uh, Mondays in the Americas and then Tuesday mornings um, in, in Asia Pacific. Um, and this is hosted by uh, Dr. Carolina Sukmaji, um, who's in Australia, and she has, um, um, is, she's also working with Jan Lechval and Dolores DeVizio. And as I said, Dolores is joining the call today. Dolores, do you just want to say hi to everybody? Yes, Ken, sorry, I was muted. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to what will be a very interesting discussion. Thanks, Dolores. So it's great to have you here and, and great to have the support of WebEV talk on this uh, session as well. So um, the final slide before we get into things is about um, ISEV. So many of you are members of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles. And unfortunately, we couldn't have our in-person meeting this year, which is the biggest EV meeting in the world. Um, it's been running since 2012. And this annual meeting is something that we all look forward to. Um, every year we look forward to it. Um, and get a lot out of it. But this year we're going virtual. Uh, we will have an event that runs from July 20th to 22nd. And as an ISEV member, you get a, a, a discount on this meeting. I think it's about $150 to, um, to attend. But for the first time ever, you can actually not just attend the three-day in-person meeting, but you'll also have access to all of the content for two months. So if you want to, and if you have the, the time and energy to do it, you could look at every single thing that comes out of that meeting. Um, 
So please consider joining us for that. I think it's gonna be very exciting, um, even if we can't be in the same room together. Um, so it, it's gonna feature, of course, our plenaries. Um, our, we'll have some discussion sessions, um, our usual or oral and poster presentations. And then um, you can also interact with our, with our sponsors and the people who you know, provide the technology and the tools that we need for our research. So I hope to see many of you there. So um, I, I entitled our slide this week, uh, EV microRNAs, wimps or warriors? What do microRNAs actually do? Um, are they in EVs? Are they not in EVs? And do they transfer functionally? Um, so I'm gonna start out by just giving a, a, a brief history of what we know about microRNAs and siRNAs. So siRNAs, of course, were discovered first. Um, and you know, really the difference between an siRNA and a microRNA is just in the really in the mode of action. I mean, it's kind of a semantic thing. So an siRNA is typically thought to be um, an RNA that will have perfect complementarity to its target sequence. And then this would result in cleavage, you know, in most situations. So what then is a microRNA? A microRNA is a, a, an RNA of similar size to an siRNA, but it binds with imperfect complementarity to its target, mostly focused on a so-called seed sequence um, that's in one end of the microRNA. And this might only be uh, six or so, six or seven nucleotides long, um, so that there's a, there's a lot of opportunities for binding. Um, there's also a lot of non-canonical things that happen. And so what's thought to occur when a microRNA binds to its target, depending on the circumstances, is that you could have, um, you could have shutdown of translation by several mechanisms. And this could be translational inhibition, it could be leading to deadenylation. You might also have some cleavage in some situations. But again, the difference between the siRNA and the microRNA is simply, um, we, we could present it this way anyway, as, as, as the degree of binding, the degree of complementarity with the target. Um, and at the heart, I think, of all of this um, with the microRNAs is the argonaut uh, protein, which is part of the RNA-induced silencing complex. And so the, the microRNA is loaded into the argonaut as it's made, as it becomes mature, and then it acts as part of the argonaut complex. Um, unfortunately, you know, um, I think that, that there, there is not a lot of great, um, let me go back, I don't know why that animation is, is still going. So in any case, the, um, the, the pathway of siRNA was really worked out quite well in the model organism C. elegans. So this is this little nematode, you know, that lives in the soil. And so the nematode has an ability to spread siRNAs between, um, be, uh, and, and, and I should say longer RNAs too, between cells. So it has a specific transporter for that. Another thing that it's able to do is that if it gets sequences that it wants to target, it can use those sequences to make more siRNAs. Um, so it's able to amplify the effects. And then it's also able to take up RNA from its environment. And so for a C. elegans, the, the RNAi pathway is kind of like, a, it's kind of like an immune system. Um, for mammals, yeah, we might have some of these transporters that's a little bit controversial, but it doesn't seem that most of these mechanisms are in play. And so we have to work with what's in the cell. Um, and as a result, we have to worry about things like stoichiometry. And so here is a, a paper that came out actually back in 2003 um, talking about the, the stoichiometry of siRNA-mediated um, uh, silencing. And so in this, um, in, in this study, there was a particular RNA, I think it was MAP, MAP kinase 4, that they were trying to target. And so they had an siRNA to that, to, that, to that target, but then they wanted to look at the off-target effects. And off-target effects, in a lot of ways, you could consider those to be microRNA effects. Um, and so in this study, the, 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 the greatest concentration of RNAs was 60 million molecules per cell, and they kept on titrating that down until they could find that there were no or very few off-target effects. And so this is an illustration of where when you have 100 nanomolar RNA in this, um, uh, treating the cells, you see all these different off-target effects. But when you get down to 0.16, you can see that they're in the middle with that, um, with that arrow. It's mostly just the, the effects that you're seeing on that actual target RNA. So you're able to get down to about 100,000 copies per cell, and then you couldn't see um, the effect anymore. Um, and this is just another illustration of how this works. You know, you can see some of the off-target transcripts here, um, where there, there's like, you know, a, a, the, the, the green is the, the, the transcript that they wanted to knock down. Um, and above that, you know, you only see a few of the, of the other RNAs in the cell that are getting affected. 
um, even at, at full changes that you could expect to, to even quantitate accurately using quantitative PCR. So um, I think what we can conclude from this um, is that the RNA effects, the microRNA-like effects, these off-target effects of siRNA are not very strong. Um, and Hervé cites, I'm not sure um, many of you probably know him, but he wrote this really nice piece back in 2009 that was called Redefining MicroRNA Targets. And in this piece, he, um, he, he uh, made the case that, you know, most genes that we have are haplosufficient. That means we can, we can get by with one of them, one copy. Um, and, 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 and actually the microRNA, um, the microRNA effects in the cell um, are actually going to be outweighed by the effects of normal of normal, um, uh, of, of, of normal uh, fluctuations in gene expression. So you have these very minute um, effects of, of microRNAs in the cell, and you have to have quite a few microRNAs around. Um, this is also consistent with what's been reported, um, for example, from this group that developed a technique called CLASH, where they could look at direct binding of a microRNA to its target. Um, and you can see there on, it looks really fuzzy on my screen, but it looks, um, you know, the, the, the x-axis here, these uh, fold changes are very, very small. So even when you go to a perfect seed that has been confirmed by these direct binding assays, you actually get very small um, effects on targets for most, most targets. Now, there are exceptions. Um, and I did a comparison one time when I, I looked through the literature and I was, um, I was trying to understand, you know, what, what kinds of stoichiometries are out there. Um, a, lot of, a lot of papers that we see are using these luciferase, um, luciferase assays where, you know, we have a microRNA target in a three prime UTR um, and that, that three prime UTR is attached to a reporter, um, a sequence encoding a reporter like luciferase. And many, in many cases, we're actually using 10, like 10 million copies of a microRNA um, that are used to treat one cell, right? So, so this, is, this is how many might be used in, you know, in a typical luciferase assay. Um, it's been reported in the literature that having 6 million copies per cell of some RNA sequences can cause um, immune stimulation, so an off-target effect. Um, having 100,000 um, 100, copies of a microRNA per cell might give you off-target effects um, or even saturation of the, of the RNA machinery, the RNAi machinery. Um, and then how many microRNAs are needed in a cell for regulation? The estimates vary widely, but maybe a thousand, maybe, maybe less than that. It depends on exactly what binding site we have. Um, and I, I, I was looking in the, when I did this comparison at a study where there was a treatment that was done with giving RNAs um, orally, and they were looking at how many RNAs could actually get into the liver. Well, there was hardly anything that was delivered, but even what got into the circulation would be um, less than one uh, microRNA per cell in the liver, which is where actually most of the stuff in the blood goes. Um, so it seems that, you know, I think we do have um, some questions about the stoichiometry of, uh, of microRNA and microRNA mediated regulation. Um, but we also have some things on the other side uh, that's, that indicate that microRNAs can actually be very potent depending on the situation. Um, this is a paper that came out from um, Craig Thompson's lab. Uh, back in uh, 2014 that showed that in many cells in the body, they were using mice here, looking at organs of mice, most of the microRNAs are not in active complexes. So maybe this means that the active microRNAs, they and when I say an active complex, I mean like a microRNA that's actually associated with an mRNA and with all of this protein machinery that's needed to, to make sure that the regulation occurs. So if most of the microRNAs are not there, then our calculations could be completely wrong. It could be that five copies of a microRNA can really have, a, have an important effect um, if they are in the right molecular context. Um, so there's, there's a lot of... Um, questions that have come up. I'm not going to talk a lot about EVs right now because we're going to hear more about EVs and microRNAs, and I think most of the people on the call are quite familiar with EVs. Uh, but it was really in the 2000s that we had this rise of what we could call the xRNA hypothesis, or actually hypotheses. Um, and, and part of it is, you know, something that's near and dear to my heart, which is the retrovirus. You know, we've known about retroviruses for decades, and the retroviruses are very good at transferring RNA from one cell to another. There are other RNA viruses, of course, as well. Um, so we know that RNA can be transferred be between cells, and we'll hear more about that from Manuel in just a minute. Um, but uh, it, it was found, you know, in the, in the early 2000s that HIV uses EV biogenesis pathways and that EVs also influence HIV. For example, they can transfer HIV co-receptors. Um, and then it was uh, in the middle part of the last decade that we saw um, several very influential papers come out 
reporting that EVs themselves, uh, absent any kind of viral influence, could actually transfer um, RNAs as well. Um, and so we have the uh, first author of one of these papers on, um, on the call today who's going to be telling us more about this. Um, the, um, the question of where are the extracellular microRNAs, I think will also be touched on today. So there were a couple of papers in 2011 that were also very influential showing that, or purporting to show that most microRNAs um, in blood and elsewhere um, are outside of EVs. So there are microRNAs associated with EVs, but there are many microRNAs that are not. Um, then we also had a, a, a paper from uh, Munish Tawari's lab that, that was from 2014, where they tried to look at the stoichiometry of microRNAs and EVs. And what did they find? They reported that there's typically a lot less than one copy per, um, per EV. In fact, for any given microRNA, you, you might have to look at 10,000 EVs before you find one copy of that microRNA course, again, depending on abundance. Um, and they went through a lot of, you know, a lot of the potential caveats here, like could these, could these findings be explained because of the method of quantitation? Um, could it be the method of, of RNA um, quantification? Could it be that EVs get damaged? Maybe they get damaged during, um, during the separation process. Um, and, you know, and one thing they couldn't rule out was that there might be some EVs in their population that have hundreds of copies, and they just, uh, because they're looking at the population level, couldn't distinguish between those possibilities. Uh, but, we, you know, I think we, even today, six years after that paper came out, we still have some big questions about EVs and microRNAs, like how many are actually in the EVs? Um, are they specifically loaded? In what form are they carried in, micro, in, in the EVs? Um, and there was actually a nice uh, editorial earlier this year from Alyssa Weaver's, uh, Alyssa Weaver and James Patton um, in Cancer Research. You might want to take a look at that. Um, we still don't know what the typical mode of action for EVs is. I mean, we, it's probably different for different kinds of EVs. Um, and the fusion. So how do EVs achieve fusion with the cell? We'll hear more about that again today. Um, so with that, I'm just going to hand this over now to, uh, to Manuel Albanese. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I start sharing mine. Hi, everyone. Go ahead and start sharing yours. Welcome, Manuel. Can you see it? Not yet. Yes. There we go. Okay, perfect. Looks good. So, uh, th thanks a lot, Kenneth, for uh, inviting me uh, today to present my work. And um, so we are really happy to be here to present our work. I have to say we are quite surprised for how, uh, how was interesting for the, for the community. We didn't expect that, but we are really happy about it. So uh, what I'm going to show you today is the preprint we published just um, like a week ago. But I want also to give you an overview of how this story started. So to do this, I have to say that the Wolfgang Amerschmidt lab is uh, originally not an AV lab, but um, but the Epstein Barr virus lab. So uh, the main topic of the of the lab is uh, studying Epstein Barr virus. And just to give you an overview of the virus, I I put quickly. I so it in fact is an herpes virus that infects 95% of the population. So most of the people that are uh, actually here today are. Um, infected. And uh, so what is important to know is that as, as a strong tropism against B-cells and epithelial cells, and as a really big double strand DNA genome that encodes for 44 different viral microRNA. So these viral microRNA are actually really unique, so they're completely different from the human one. And so it's really easy to study them because um, you can really distinguish the effect from the viral microRNA to the human one. On top of this, our lab established a virus that uh, encodes for no microRNA. And this is the, the virus that I used for all over the, the paper. And that we also use uh, during my PhD, uh, for the work of my PhD, together with Takanobu Tagawa here, in which we show that inside the infected B cells, the ABV microRNA are extremely important. So what they do is targeting different stages of antigen presentation inside the affected B cells. And this confer um, like a protection uh, for the immune so to the immune system, meaning that if the microRNA are there after ABV infects the cells, they, the, the, the cells will be almost invisible for the immune system. If you use a virus that lacks the ABV microRNAs, 
these cells will be recognized and killed completely from the immune system. So the microRNA are extremely important for the cells to be to infect and spread. Okay. So the point was at that time and was like four years ago, we since the ADV microRNA were so important inside the cells, we thought that actually was an easy shot project to show that actually they're actually possibly affecting also antigen presenting cells that are just neighboring to the infected B cells. So in our hypothesis, ABV microRNAs from infected B cells that was just transferred by EVs in other antigen presenting cells and they were just acting in the same way. So I try really hardly to um, isolate EVs from those cells with or without microRNA and using different kind of readouts on antigen presenting cells, but I have to say I never really saw any effect. Or if I could see effects on antigen presenting cells with AVs containing microRNAs, I was observing just the same with EVs that were not containing microRNA, meaning that the effects was not microRNA mediated, but just only EV mediated. So um, as I mentioned, it's four years now after, um, after these hypotheses we had, and actually, uh, so what I'm telling you today is completely the reverse of our starting hypothesis. Okay, so I was extremely frustrated and uh, disappointed that my experiments were not working, so I decided to just step back. And I decided to say, okay, let's, let's be sure that what I, my EVs are really EVs, and that the, and I wanted to really characterize the EVs released by those cells. So I started with a really simple um, setup. So as you can see here, this is how uh, we isolate EVs in our lab. It's a pretty uh, standard way of isolating, I think. Uh, so uh, you, you collect the supernatant or the conditioned media from, from the cells, and then you, you just treat the supernatant with uh, different cell uh, centrifugation steps. So what I think what is, uh, we are adding on top is the second mini ultra centrifugation, so in a small volume. These allow a second cleaning of the EVs, plus you are pelleting them in a really small and compact pellet that you can easily load on an optical density gradient. So the optical density gradient is extremely important because so if you load your um, mini UC here at the bottom, then uh, they will float up to the fraction which that has the same density as, as these EVs. So like this, you are able to separate three EVs to, um, uh, to the protein. So the EVs from the free protein. So to show you how it looks like, so we, we checked by NTA where the EVs were and they looked like, looked like they were mainly in fraction two and three, a little bit in fraction four. And we could also validate this finding by Western Lot as you can see of a TSG-101, a human TSG-101 known to be enriched in EVs, as well as for LMP1, that is a viral protein that is also known and reported to be enriched. And we could see that the calnexin was, was missing, so indicating that our EVs were uh, really pure. As you can see from the mini UC pellet, you still see a little bit of calnexin. So I think the optical gradient really does uh, improve your EV preparation. So that's what we use uh, as standard. So as I mentioned you, I wanted to characterize the micronades inside this, um, this preparation. So what I did is uh, purifying RNA from each and every step of the purification of the EVs. And then I checked, first of all, the quality of the RNA. So, and, um, as, you, so as you know, um, so this is a nice, uh, bioanalyzer data from the total RNA, so with the two nice ribosomal peaks. And then, as you know, um, as more you go on with the purification, as more you're, you have an enrich on the small RNAs. That's what we observed. So with the mean UC, we could we lose completely the ribosomal RNA, and we had an, a big enrich on the small one. Okay, but uh, on all of these, where are the microRNAs? So to, to check where the micronates were, we establish an absolute quantification of the micronate to not only see if they're there or not, but also to know how many. And to do this, you have to um, need, you need the RNA oligo that mimics the mature micronate. And then first of all, you do a several uh, serial dilution of the micronate. You do the RT specific for each and every micronate, and then you do the QPCR. 
So that's quite a lot of work because you have to do it um, every single time when you do a quantification. But this is really informative because it's giving you an uh, absolute number at the end. And as you can see on the right, so uh, this is a, an example for one of the viral microRNAs we checked. You can see that um, you have a nice curve and then you can calculate uh, basic, basically based on these, your um, value for the microRNAs. Okay, so knowing this, um, the important thing that I have to mention is that um, you need to spike in, uh, in this case is a, is a quite common technique. So the uh, C elegance microRNA 39, uh, with a known amount of copy in a way that you can see how much actually you're losing while your um, RNA extraction and RT and QPCR. To be sure that what you see, um, so you can always compare to the original input from the really beginning. Okay, so that's an important control to keep in mind. And we always include it in each and every preparation. Okay, so where are the microRNAs? So here I'm showing uh, the example for three different viral microRNA and one human one. And as you can see, as I was going on with the preparation, actually the level, the absolute level of microRNAs were going down. And uh, after the ultra centrifugation, actually most of them were um, left in the conditioned media, depleted of, of DVs and not in the pellet. And this was true for all of them, meaning that or suggesting that somehow ABV microRNA, but as well as the human microRNA 16, was actually mainly outside and not inside the EVs. So just to show you in a different perspective, so if you look at the um, NTA um, analysis of, um, of this preparation, you can nicely see that, so that's an example, but usually we have from the conditioning media to the UC pellet around eight to 10 times more enrichment of EVs. Uh, whether from this conditioned media to the final step so uh, the, of the mini UC pellet, we usually have from 70 to um, 200 percent, so 100 fold increase. So this is, these are the EVs particles, but if you look at the microRNAs, actually you do see that they uh, slightly increase in the mini UC pellet as a concentration here uh, for ML, uh, but the, the concentration, so the, it's just 1.2 to two times more is not, it's really far away. So there is no strong correlation with actually the EVs enrichment. So again, suggesting that uh, the micronates are still, are mainly outside. And this brings me to like question my, my things always. So uh, this is true. So looks like that only a minor fraction is enriching EVs and most of them are outside. But can it be that um, the EVs are just destroyed because of the ultra centrifugation and just doing things uh, too harsh? And then the microRNA are released in the CM just during the preparation. So to be sure that the first point is true, we decided to, um, to use a second purification method that's the size exclusion chromatography. So the first stage step is more or less similar to the one I showed you before. The only difference is that here we are using um, centrifugal filter to um, concentrate of 10 times our uh, conditioned media, okay? And after this stage, you just load one ml of 10 times concentrated conditioned media. So imagine starting from 10 ml uh, in a size exclusion column. And then we just uh, purify 20 fraction out of it and we check where the particles and where the proteins just to be sure that our uh, purification and allows us to distinguish between the protein and the particles. As you can see here, so we have the particles mainly in fraction seven, eight, and nine, and then all the free protein outside of the EVs. Okay, but where are the micronates? So the micronates, and this is just an example, but in the paper you can see that we have done all four um, of them and they look just the same. So the microRNAs are actually mainly in fraction 12 to 20 where the protein, free protein are and not seven, eight and nine. So as Kenneth mentioned, this is um, in line with the publication from the Tiwari um, lab and also from Turkino Beach et al. And so I have to say that this is actually uh, down estimating a little bit technically what is outside. Because if you consider that I'm using a centrifugal filter to, to concentrate my, um, my supernatant, and this has only 100 kilodalton of, of cutoff, some of the micronate 
that are outside the EVs are actually going uh, through the column. So I check there are some, uh, so I'm losing a little bit of them. But the problem is that when I try to avoid this, the, con the concentration and I was loading directly one ML in the size exclusion chromatography, I couldn't detect the peak of microRNA in the EVs. So this size exclusion chromatography was designed to optimize uh, and to really ch check the EVs and the microRNA. So if you see that this is a really small fraction, actually is even smaller, just consider it. Okay. So, but anyway, there are some microRNAs inside, inside the EVs. Okay. So the question is, are they actually functional? So to do this, first of all, we have to check which are the best target cells to do these kind of experiments. And to do these, we, um, we use um, a, a dye called PKH26, but we are using also different ones that um, just bind to the lipidic uh, membrane of the EVs. And to stain them, we use the mini UC pellet. We, we stain them, and after this, to wash away the free dye, we are again using an OptiPep gradient. And as I mentioned you, so if you have, um, if you load them on the bottom, you expect them to float on the top, okay? So this is really the only way we could uh, get rid of the free dye because we try different ways, but uh, so ultra by ultra simplification, you don't get rid of it. So, and this is how it looks like. So we, I, I did it for uh, different ones just to show you. Um, so you can see that uh, there is a nice um, layer of EVs uh, with the color uh, of, the, of the dye. So meaning that the, the dye works really nicely and you can really um, divide the, the EVs from, from the rest. Okay, so we use those preparations and in this case PKH26 on top of uh, different cells to see which is the best target cells. And as you can see, the two nitrate cells, they were the one performing the best, uh, followed by the THP1 that are a monocytic cell line and the LCL. So that the LCLs are those primary B cells that we generated at the beginning and that are the source of the EVs. Okay, so the two nitrate cells are the best cells. We also try with PBMCs and as reported by, by other groups, um, so including the factor group, so they were mostly binding to dendritic cells, monocytes and PDCs, a little bit to B cells, but no, not at all to T cells. Okay. So, but my question at this point was, are they only binding to the membrane or are they actually releasing actively their cargo? And the, so the point is, is the cargo also releasing, so re, um, is the cargo of those EVs also reaching the cytoplasm? So, and to do this, actually, we invest really a lot of time. So we work more than two years now also with, with Adam uh, to have a robust and a nice system to track this. And this is uh, what we call uh, EV fusion assay. And this is coming from, um, from actually a completely different field. So uh, two years ago, I moved as a postdoc to another lab. So the lab of Oliver Kepler that does HIV biology. And I realized that since 2002, there was this nice assay in which they incorporate the BLAM uh, actively inside the virions of the virus, and then they can track the infection, just the, the early phase of the fusion of the virus, just by this assay. So because the beta-lactamase is released inside the cells, and then this uh, dye is cleaved by the beta-lactamase, and you will see a shift from green light to blue light, okay? And this is really sensitive because it's an enzymatic reaction. So few molecules of the beta-lactamase are enough to chop many, many molecules of the dye. So you will see over time that, uh, that you will have a nice signal coming from the beta-lactamase once it's transferred. Of course, we adapted to EVs, and this was also um, a lot of work. So we fused the BLAM, uh, the beta-lactamase with many different proteins, but we found CD63 to be the best one to, to be able to deliver um, this construct to the, to the cells by EVs. So, and our, how the experiments looks like, so we have CD63 beta-lactamase expressing cells. This can be LCLs, can be two nitrate cells. In this case, I'm just showing you experiments from two nitrate cells. You get the conditioned medium or just purified EVs from them, and you incubate those uh, beta-lactamase EVs um, together with the cells. You wait for four hours at 37 degrees, then you wash the cells and you stain them with this dye uh, that is perme cell permeable. You need uh, to wait 16 hours 
to give the time, the base lactamase to chop the, the substrate. And then um, after this waiting time, you just can fix the cells or just immediately measure them by flow cytometry. Okay, so and this is how it looks like. So um, you have this uh, green color, uh, as you can see in the negative control, that it doesn't switch to, um, to a blue. So, and this is because there were no EVs. When we treat them with EVs with CD63 BLAM, uh, we also surprisingly have to say we were expecting here to see a little bit of fusion. We didn't observe any fusion, whether uh, using a quasi control BSBG that is boosting the binding and the fusion uh, that is coming from the vesicular stomatite virus. We actually could see that every cell was, um, was getting the, the beta lactamase. So meaning that potentially every cell can get it, but somehow our EVs from LCLs were not fusing in this case with two natri cells so well. Okay, so we try the same uh, with, uh, with EVs. So the same EVs, but staying with PKH26. For the question I mentioned before, is the PKH26 dye just an indication of binding or also of fusion? And to do this, we, we prefer the EVs plus or minus BSDG, always containing CD63 BLAM, and we stain them with this PKH26 dye. As you can see from the different fraction, so putting the cells together with a different fraction, we could get a nice staining of the cells. This was a bit, little bit better with BSDG as expected, but not so much. So anyway, we could see a nice PKH staining of cells treated with EVs, also without BSDG. But looking at the fusion, uh, again, surprisingly, we could see that our AVs were not fusing at all, uh, if not with BSBG. So BSBG, there was a really a lot of fusion, but without BSBG, it was not working. So meaning that somehow those AVs that are PKH26 positive, but without BSBG, they're somehow binding or they can be internalized, but the content of these AVs is not, released, is not reaching the cytoplasm. Okay, so that's a really important, I think. And we we're unable to find this kind of, um, this kind of uh, proof, if not with our fusion assay. Okay, so we were really happy to find it. Okay, and we also tried the same EVs uh, without PKH this time on PBMCs. And again, so with BSBG, we could see a really nice fusion with mostly monocytes, dendritic cells and PTCs. Uh, and we saw a really, really uh, light, um, fusion with dendritic cells and PDCs. But this was really um, close to the background, so it's not, really, um, it's not really high. Okay. So meaning that somehow even the, the content of EVs released from LCS, but as well as from two nitrous cells, that they were the two donor cells we checked, we checked, is not as efficiently as we consider at the beginning, um, if uh, again without BSVG. So this was a bit surprising for us, I have to say, but uh, now we are really, really believe that this is true. Okay, but anyway, I was insisting on, um, are they micronay functional? So we see that some of micronays are inside. Okay, are they functional? The best assay we have to address this is the dual luciferous reported assay. We introduced three perfect target matches for the micronay of interest. Um, and this leads to a really strong reduction, as you can see on the bottom, um, as more uh, microRNA you are expressing in the same cells. It's important to say that this is a dual luciferase reporter, meaning that the firefly is also there, and the firefly is, is really important to normalize um, the value of the renilla, okay? Just to be sure that you don't have an artifact just because um, the, the expression of both of the, um, of the luciferase goes down, okay? So we, in here, we just tested the expression of the micronase, but we decided to use as a source of micronase this time the EVs. Okay, and we set up a simple experiment. So we transfect donor cells to nitri cells expressing the micronase, uh, plus or minus BSBG, because of course we know that with BSBG we have almost 100% fusion. So meaning that uh, this is our positive control to boost the transfer. Then we collect this uh, conditioned media, but we have done it also with um, purified EVs. And then you put them on top of recipient cells that are expressing this dual luciferase reporter. And as you can see from the results, 
independently if the microneo were, was there or not, and independently if VSVG was there or not, we could never see uh, any effect um, on the dual luciferase, so on the renilla, okay, specific for BHRF12. Meaning that somehow we cannot really see any functional uh, microRNA dependent effect even when we boost the fusion. Okay. So, and I want to conclude with one of, so my favorite experiment, because Adam was thinking, well, I have my cells expressing the dual luciferase reporter and the cells expressing the microRNA. Why I just don't do the reverse? So, why I don't try to transfer the mRNA or the luciferase uh, protein? So what I did then is transfecting don as a donor cells this time dual luciferous reporter uh, for the microneo of interest. And then you collect the C C uh, CM from these and you put them on top of recipient cells expressing or not the micronates. So I have to say um, eco transfect always BSVG here because when we was trying to do it without BSVG, we couldn't see any, uh, any transfer. So the luciferase uh, was uh, just the background level. Okay, so how it looks like. So if you, um, if you look at the luciferase activity, you can nicely see actually that we could detect some luciferase activity. And this was somehow downregulated if the cells uh, that were receiving, so the target cells receiving um, the dual luciferase reporter were expressing the microRNA of interest. Meaning that, so this is a clear indication that the mRNA was transferred, okay. Uh, and, and the mRNA was just uh, not translated because of the microRNAs, okay. But is also the protein transfer? That was our question. So we decided to treat or not the cells with cyclohexamide. So the cells treated with cyclohexamide that blocks the translation, as you can see, at the flat uh, activity of the luciferase. So I have, I have to say that, and this is important to, to understand, that these values are normalized. Actually, the um, absolute values for the treatment with cyclohexamide, they're pretty similar to the one of the left graph with, uh, treated with uh, uh, microRNA BHRF12. So meaning that the values are lower because uh, we don't have expression de novo of the protein from the mRNA, but we, we do see only the protein transfer. But interestingly, in this case, BHRF12 cannot do much because the protein is already a protein and cannot affect the, the expression. Okay, so meaning that we have a little bit of protein transfer, but we do have also quite some mRNA that is enough to be detected. Okay. Okay, but why are microRNA not active then? So if we, in principle, can transfer and deliver um, something. So, and this, so this is my final slide. So um, we did the absolute quantification on different purification we have performed of the microRNA. And we saw that you need uh, like 300 to 10,000 EVs to make a single copy of, of microRNA. And that's probably why uh, we couldn't see any effect even boosting um, our, our system. So we came out with two, um, so we came out that microRNAs in EVs are actually facing, so in our experiments are facing two main obstacles. So first of all, actually the delivery of EVs into target cells is not as efficient as we consider at first, okay. But we also know that even boosting these, the microRNA are not affecting the target. So meaning that uh, there is a second obstacle that is the low copy number of microRNA in those EVs, okay. So this is an important take home message because this is the point of the old paper. Okay, so in summary, I hope I convinced you that the microRNA and we, we show this with two different methods that the microRNA are mainly outside the EVs and not inside, that our EV fusion assay actually is really sensitive and allows to measure the cargo release in the cytoplasm. So that's a really important point because um, you can have, even if you have cargo release and this um, is entering the endosomes and then later on the lysosomes, I mean, we, we do have cargo release, but this will not be functional. So our EV fusion assay measures the functionality of the cargo release. Okay. And um, so we observed that with BSVG, so when we boost the fusion, we have actually transfer of protein and mRNA, we do, we do see them. 
but we were incapable of seeing, even in this condition, microRNA delivery. And as I mentioned before, it's just because the microRNA are just in too low numbers to, to be really effective on, on those target cells. You would need like an amazing amount of um, EVs that would be not feasible, I think, to, uh, to really deliver uh, enough copy. Okay, so, but from our experiment experience, we learn a lot. And so I want to share with you what we learned. So first of all, and, and this is kind of obvious now in the community, but I, I wanted to put it anyway, is that you really have to be careful validating your EV purification methods. So we invest a lot of time on optimizing it to be sure that our EVs were really pure and not contaminated with microRNA outside the EVs. So you have to be sure that your method, so that, that your microRNA of interest is actually enriched in EVs. Um, we did an absolute quantification. I know it's, it's difficult to judge how many microRNAs are enough to be functional, but if you see, as in our case, that you have one microRNA out of 10,000 EVs, I doubt that you will see that this microRNA will be functional. Okay. So one important point is to use the proper controls. So we show that, so we always use EVs with or without microRNAs coming from the same cells. So this is a really important to distinguish what is actually caused by microRNA and what is just an effect of the treatment of the EVs because the EVs, they do something, right? So you have to be sure that what you see is microRNA uh, uh, driven. So when you label the, your EVs with dyes, please use the only dye control. I didn't show you today, but I have it in the publication. So it's really important to validate your method of purification of the dye and also to show that you don't have free dye outside. Uh, this is something that I didn't show, but is coming also from our experience. So if you stain the cells with the dye and then you uh, get EVs from them after 48 hours, 72, doesn't matter, collect the supernatal at time point zero, because these will give you the background from again, the free dye that is not uh, labeled to cells. So this is really important because these are all, these are all points that might uh, cause uh, artifacts or uh, might cause false positive results. Okay, and um, finally, as a last point, I hope I convince you that our EV fusion assay is a really effective assay to uh, ass assess the delivery of the cargo. Of course, there are um, so quite some more out, out there, but I, I think, so our address, as I mentioned, two things, and one of them is the delivery in the cytoplasm, uh, but whatever EV fusion you use, is important to prove that the Vs that you are using are actually fusing with the target cells you're using to really find the best EV and target cells. And in case you can always use a VSBG or any other envelope protein um, to really prove uh, these as a positive control. Okay. So with this, I want to thank all the people that um, are taking part to, to part of this project, particularly to um, Adam, that, uh, so as you can see, is a um, co-author uh, together with me, uh, co-first author, because he invests a lot of time, especially with the fusion assay and helped me a lot with all the experiments. And of course, I want to thanks a lot, Katrin and Taka uh, for, um, and also Wolfgang, of course, for helping me uh, all over the project and also with the presentation of today. And thank you all for your attention. Well, thanks very much, uh, Manuel. And um, we have had a lot of questions coming in. So we'll have, I think, a lot of, um, a lot of good discussion pretty soon. But first of all, I would like to, um, to hand over the, uh, the screen sharing to Mikhail Pechtel. Uh, Mikhail, thanks so much for joining us today um, and for uh, providing your perspectives on this, uh, on this interesting manuscript. So it's all yours, Mikhail. Thanks, Ken. Um, I'm not going to share my screen because I think um, that, that discussing the data itself should be sufficient. First, I want to give out uh, an applause to, to Manuel for a perfect presentation and also very nice work. I don't agree with all of the conclusions that he makes uh, on his work, but uh, it's sure that he made a, uh, a lot of effort uh, to, um, uh, to show, to demonstrate functional transfer of uh, micronase through vesicles. Um, I also think it's a good idea to use these LCL cells as a, um, uh, as a donor uh, EV, um, because indeed these EVV microRNAs are not expressed elsewhere. So this is a clever system 
Um, and as many of you know, uh, this is a system we used already 10 years ago to show uh, transfer of microRNAs. And in our opinion, we thought we also measured functional transfer. Um, so there's a couple of things that, that struck me in this, in this article and also in the presentation. Um, and um, I will just go into the idea that I think the, 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 um, um, the isolations of the EVs, everything, I think this was really well done, very careful. Um, so I believe that although um, you might always uh, look at other papers and that th there's always differences, right? Um, but some of the calculations, um, and this is what this group is known for, because as Manuel perhaps knows, I actually studied EVB quite a lot in my career and also have done uh, quantitative um, experiments with microRNAs. And, um, and what I see here in their paper uh, is that they see about 0.0034 copies of an EBV microRNA part, uh, what is it, BSR of one, two, um, per EV. What they also state is that they add about 100,000 EVs per cell. And so they, they have a, a huge amount of EVs, they add these pretty target cells. And if I then do a calculation, uh, 100,000 times 0.003, uh, four, I get around 340 copies of a microRNA. Now they claim also in the paper that about 20 to 100 copies of a microRNA per cell should be sufficient to get a 50% reduction in the luciferase. So, and if this VSV uh, expression is super efficient, as they say, almost 100% efficient in delivering their cargo, you should get in their uh, data at least, uh, let's say, 300 micronase per, uh, per cell. This should be enough um, in their own assay based on their own calculations. Um, am I making the wrong calculation or what am I missing something here? Can I question to Manuel? Can I, yeah. So yeah. actually this is, uh, if you consider that every microRNA that is in the preparation will, uh, will then be delivered in the cytoplasm, right? Yes. So it's no, really it is to the cells, to the cytoplasm. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not convinced yet because I, I'm convinced by your essay that, that uh, some EVs uh, do not deliver their cargo to the cytoplasm. Um, but you said with VSV they do, right? It's a very efficient cargo delivery. So the amount of EVs that you add to these target cells should uh, um, should lead to at least, let's say, 300 micronase. Um, they might be super uh, fastly degraded, I don't know, but you should get delivery. Yeah, so that's what I was hoping to see, boosting it with BSVG. But as I mentioned you, so if you have so few copies, and uh, so if all those, so you have to expect that not all the um, EVs are containing the micronase, right? That not the micronase, will be um, so protected for all the, uh, all the time because you also keep them in culture for a while, right? Just 24 hours. So it might be that they are degraded uh, during the time and that not all of them are delivered and so on. So I really think that probably, so if you assume even if 50% uh, of them are delivered and, and they enter the, as I mentioned, the cytoplasm, might be that only some of them then they bind to ago 2 and they will be functional. Sure, so sure. that probably the dose of micronase that you need to have a functionality in BVs is much, much more than, than uh, the virtual number that you need to target these. Uh, but then what you're saying is that the, the micronase, they do enter the cells, that's basically what you're saying, or something else happened to them. Yeah, so that they're just not enough. So you, you need many, many more copies of microRNA to have an effect. But, but you say yourself that you need about uh, 22 to 200, I don't know, here somewhere, per cell to, to have an effect with your report. 20 to 300 microRNAs, copies per cell, you say. Right, so I would have to treat the cells with many, many more EVs to be sure that the functional microRNA that they reach the cells and they will be functional in those cells there will be enough. The problem I had in my experiments, and I don't know if you face the same problem, so you mentioned 100,000 uh, EVs per cells. This actually was the one of the highest dose we use. But we saw that this actually was causing some artifacts in the, in the um, uh, Renilla dual luciferase because these were just too many, too many EVs per cells. So it was, was published already a couple of, of times from uh, Kanna et al. that actually it, at least EVs from LCS, they actually show a cytotoxicity that is dose dependence. And that's also what I'm showing in one of the supplementary figures. 
because if you there is a limit of tolerance of those cells to EVs. So if you overload them too much, they just die. Uh, so meaning that what, what you say, so this 100,000 um, as a dose actually was already quite high. So to have completely no cytotoxicity of the cells, we, we, um, I think we were going up to 20,000 for cells, okay. not more than that. So but I mean, you, you do get delivery, and what, what, what I still am missing a little bit in your paper is that you don't really quantify the micronase in the target cells. That's something that I would have done, and I would advise yeah, to do, no. because then you can show, because one of the things that you, you might have seen from our paper from, uh, from 10 years ago now, is that we co-cultured uh, living cells, living LCLs with, with, with target cells over time, and we see an accumulation of the micronase in the, in the recipient cells. So it suggests that um, that does not immediate degradation. But um, mostly we how, use the. Oh, how did you divide them after the co-culture the cells? So you were co-culturing them. You mean with the trans wells or directly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can you can see it in the paper. It's. Uh, <laughs> I, I cannot. No, my point is that so in so if uh, even one or two LCLs are migrating to the other cells, then the problem is that you will have a contamination of cells expressing the microRNA. Yeah. So we, and, we, and this is enough to to have an addition of micronase in your preparation, right? Yeah, but if you read the paper, we actually uh, accounted for that. We took the, the bottom cells and we looked for EBV DNA with a very, very sensitive DNA PCR. So we did not see any LCL transfer there. So that's probably not the case. And we saw also dose dependent effects. But anyway, that, that's maybe technical, maybe not so interesting for all the other people. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is that what might be interesting is that yeah, you, you call the, the 293 cells target cells, but of course, these are not really biologically relevant target cells, right? You know that. And um, so, and the 293 cells are of course nice as target cells because you can expect your, you can express your reporters there quite well, that's easy. Um, so we've done a lot of experiments in our MODC's primary uh, cells, which are of course much more fragile, very difficult. We used AMAXA to express the reporters. Um, and we did it very differently than, than you did. Um, that could have saved you maybe some frustration um, what you had in the beginning is that we um, uh, we actually added the exosomes with the micronase way from the start. So we did not wait until the uh, recipient cells have a complete overexpression of their reporters, but we're actually trying already to compete with the transferred micronase before they get these high expression levels. Um, and it, of course, in these MODCs, um, these are phagocytic cells, they take them up quite well. So that's one thing that I think is very interesting from your article that you show and they target very well the MODCs. We find exactly the same. So I think you, your experiments and my experiments are very similar in that sense. Um, but I'm quite surprised that you only see the uptake, basically, or you see the delivery with the, with the, with the VSV, and you don't see it with the, with the non-VSV condition. Um, but I'm wondering, um, what, what are the same conditions? Because you said that you added the exosomes for four hours with the MODCs. What if you would wait a little bit longer? Would you think that yeah, maybe yeah. So then that, they could? That's actually a good point. So the point is that a VSBG fusion is quite fast. So if you wait like one or two hours, you, you see pretty much what you see at four hours. Right. We also try to, with PDCs, PVMCs especially, that we saw a little bit more uh, uptake from monocytes and PDCs to wait a bit longer. But actually, we couldn't see a benefit of waiting longer. So it looked like from our assessment, four hours are more than enough. So what, what has to happen happens, let's say, if there is fusion, there is fusion. Otherwise, waiting longer doesn't help. No. Okay. Now, that's why I, I thought when I looked at it, I would expect that if you would wait longer, you might get um, eventually some fusion, perhaps uh, because EBV has a viral protein, as you know, LMP1 on its coat that has actually a fusionogenic peptide inside, um, which could help actually the endosomal escape. But obviously, it will not be so efficient as uh, VSV. Um, one more thing, and then I will give the mic back to, uh, to Kenneth uh, for moderation. I'm sure there are other people who want to ask something. Is the little bit of the generalization of your statements. Uh, you say target cells. If you, if you look at um, the papers that have been published before by a lot of different groups, uh, they, look, they look at different uh, target cells. Some of them are very, I would say, physiologically relevant. And most of these cells actually are macrophages, cupra cells, BCs, um, glia cells, they're all cells known to take up things. Um, uh, and actually they do this by a process called epitoptic mimicry. Um, so it is possible that such cells 
um, take up exosomes over time. And so here you dump a lot of cells at once. Maybe there are contaminants in your, still in your preparation uh, that actually kills the cells. But maybe in a physiological situation, as in vivo, we showed together with Jakob Vorenen in a paper in Cell in, in 2015, that in vivo actually the transfer of mRNA, for example, is much more efficient than if you try to do it and mimic it in vitro. So there are some, I would say, some nuances you could put down in your paper, which would make it a little bit less provocative. I understand you get a lot of attention. Yeah. You can see a lot of participants in this WebDV, which is, which is good. And I can also see some of the frustration that was born. But I think that there are, of course, a lot of other groups that have shown uh, functional transfer in different systems. And I'm not necessarily saying that that means that your paper is incorrect or their paper is incorrect. But, you know, we keep, have to keep that in mind. We're scientists. You know, this is not dogma. Um, but it's very clear that your experiments with diffusion and the cargo delivery, although, mind it, it's actually CD63 exposure on the cytoplasm. That's actually what you're measuring. You're not necessarily measuring cargo delivery, but to be uh, completely accurate. Um, I think that this will definitely be a very good assay for a lot of people to use. So my comments there. Yeah, so um, I agree with you that might be so because I received, I saw a lot of critiques because of the title, but even let's say changing the title, uh, the content is the same. So I agree with you, we, are, we have limited uh, amount of donor cells and probably also limited amount of recipient cells that we have been testing. Um, so this is true, but the point is that looks like, so the message that we have out there is that every microRNA release in the EVs is somehow functional. So you take EVs from one cell uh, and then this contains the microRNA that is expressed in the cells and you put it uh, in the target cells, this will be functional. No, and that's not true. true, right? No, so the that's point for me, the point that I want to make is that, so it's more like an exception that a general rule. So there, there might be some microRNA that are really highly um, enriched in those EVs and uh, EV is released from some tissue or a specific cells is taken up by, mm -hmm. by more by cell, other cells than others. And in this specific case, then you will have a potential functional of that. But that, that's, that's not a general rule. It's not, a, it's not so easy uh, and um, doesn't occur so frequently as, as it is published, I think. Right, but then, then your general rule as you write it down is then also not uh, true, right? So there are exceptions and these exceptions could be quite important also in vivo. But anyway, that's the friendly conversation I think from, from my side. And, and again, uh, thanks for, for uh, yeah, giving the opportunity to, to comment on this. Thanks. Yeah, well, thank you too. Uh, thanks to both of you um, for being willing to, uh, to come on here and share your, share your experience and your knowledge with us. Um, we have had a, an amazing um, diversity of questions here, and I'm not even sure how we, um, how we put them all together. Dolores, uh, do you have any suggestions about where to start? Yeah, uh, yeah, I've been looking at the questions. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so first of all, Manuel, this was a great presentation. Um, and very interesting study for sure. So most of the questions are technical um, uh, and include uh, basically reviewer targets. Uh, you might want to consider these uh, problems in terms of uh, how the vesicles were quantified, if the vesicles were treated with the protease and RNAs before looking at the RNA inside, if the cells um, if there was cell death, if you had um, um, serum in the medium, etc. And I don't think we need to um, scrutinize uh, each of them also because um, I think we are uh, out so of If you want, I can reply quickly. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. So just, uh, most of the things are already mentioned in the material methods. I'm actually, tr I tried also with Catherine to be as more clear as possible. So if you actually see anything that it's not clear, just please send me an email. Uh, but the point is that so we use EV-free FCS that we tested to be free of, of vesicles. The vesicles are measured measure usually by the zeta view, so the MTA, by an MTA analysis. So, and I have to say that we realized that uh, by MTA analysis, but probably um, everybody that uses it, that there is a little bit, so when you have the conditioned media or ultra centrifugation preparation in which is not clean, you have a little bit of overestimation of exosomes just because they are like protein junks or like 
protein cl clumps or whatever that they look like an exosome for the NPA analysis machine. So that's why it's better to quantify also that's what we did the microRNA um, later on when the EVs are fewer. Uh, for the proteinase K and RNases, um, I personally decided not to do it because I was looking, so if you are treating the, your, your supernatant with RNases, it will kill completely the uh, microRNAs outside. But my, one of my points was to see if the EVs, uh, so the microRNAs are inside and outside. So I wanted to be sure to, uh, to have an overview uh, that is not biased by the RNAs digestion. Uh, whether for the proteinase K, I actually remember I, I was at the ESEF meeting of Toronto and I remember a presentation, I don't remember who did that, that shows that the proteinase K uh, treatment is quite harsh and after ultra centrifugation, actually most of the EVs are, um, are affected by these. So I, I prefer to avoid the proteinase K also treatment. Yeah, I, I would just uh, I would just point out I guess um, two two things about the quantification and uh, or one one thing about quantification. So and, and Jan Jan van Dun has also just commented. Um, so on the one hand, you know I think this is also the case with the Tawari paper from 2014 that used uh, NTA to quantitate. So on the one hand, you have a lot of non EV particles that get registered by NTA. On the other hand, NTA is not sensitive um, to most of the particles below 100 nanometers or so in size, in diameter, I should say. Um, and as a result, um, a lot of the actual EVs are missed by, by NTA. So, you know, you have this counterbalancing of, of the detection of nonspecific and the non-detection of specific. So, um, so that's something important to keep in mind. And I guess the other, the other thing about the the PK treatment before the RNAs, I, I do think that's, um, that's important if it can be done, but it also would, would end up um, showing, if anything, that there were fewer microRNAs inside the, inside the EVs and not, not in the other direction. So um, just, just important to keep that in mind too. So it's also important to, to keep in mind that, that if you look at uh, microRNAs, for example, in plasma vesicles from human plasma, human plasma is very rich in RNAs, so actually most of the microRNAs in plasma EVs, they are uh, either protected by protein on the outside, which we have found also a lot, but there's definitely microRNAs inside uh, exosomes that are protein protected as we found. So actually also the microRNAs inside of EVs are uh, in our hands, at least uh, a substantial part of it are um, protected. And even though the copy numbers are low, we have talked about it a lot, but I, I would like to stress this point is that uh, if you give at any given moment, you give some some EVs to a cell, that's really not uh, biology, right? Biology is dynamic, it's kinetic. Um, there's continuous expression, there's continuous release of EVs. In fact, if you think about it, it's amazing how many microRNAs are made by cells and are secreted on a minute basis. Uh, if you look at EVs, how they're made, and we made some imaging of this um, and are released from cells, it's amazing how many uh, are made. So it's also clear that there's an enormous clearance uh, um, going on in our in our bodies basically at, at the same time. So there's a lot of it that we might not see. We, we, we extrapolate all these in vitro findings to in vivo, but I think, you know, we got to be a little bit careful there. So not there's another, yeah, the, I mean, the, the, um, the point about the protein protection, I think, is also very important. Um, so the protein partners, you know, the microRNA really doesn't do much of anything on its own. It has to have partners. So, so this, um, this question, I, I think, came up several times in the discussion as well in the chat, chat box. Um, so in what form are these microRNAs um, in, in the EVs? You know, are they, are they pre-microRNAs? You know, so are they, are they the precursor that's going to get processed maybe either in the EV or in the recipient cell, or are they single-stranded already? Are they associated with proteins such as the argonaut? Um, and then the and then the other question is, you know, Manuel, when you did your work with the uh, with the transfection, you I, I'm presuming that you were using mimics there, which are usually some form of double stranded um, precursor that would then be processed in the in the transfected cell. Um, so because the, all of the I think you know if you have one microRNA that's in an argonaut that can be delivered, it's probably going to be a whole lot more potent than a hundred just single-stranded ones that you're hoping are going to get into that complex? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the question about the microRNAs uh, mature or premature, 
So I, I know that there are reports of um, that also found uh, them in a premature uh, form. I have to say in our QPCR, we are only detecting the mature one. And uh, we didn't, let's say, stress ourselves checking the premature form just because we couldn't see any effect. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, Mikael has done some quantification of, of the premature microneve for EVs. But um, since, so as I mentioned, since I haven't seen any effect, I, I didn't want to, to invest on that. And the second thing, so um, I know that AGO2 inside EVs or outside is a kind of a con bit controversial. And so we didn't extensively check. So I, we have just a couple of experiments, but looked like that uh, when we were looking at microNA inside or outside EVs, also with the size exclusion, chromatography and so on, most of AGO2 was actually outside and we could detect a little bit uh, inside, but that was um, not comparable to the one outside. No. And for the mimics, sorry, uh, we, we never tested mimics, uh, but just overexpressing the plasmid that um, overexpress uh, the micronase in the high copy yield. We never okay, tested so, mimics. But that would have been, that would have made then a, a precursor molecule uh, mm -hmm. not not just a single strand yeah right yeah i mean it would be single stranded but it would be it would fold yeah right yeah okay that makes sense okay um so i have now dolores i have i've uh, taken the liberty to unmute people because i think there were some specific uh questions mm -hmm. that came up and some of them have to do with this um this issue of which cells and which you know which are the donor cells which are the recipient cells so um, Olivier de Jong, are, are you still on? If you are, I would love if you could um, if you could present what you uh, what you wanted to uh, to say. Olivier, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Uh, first of all, uh, great presentation and discussion so far. I really enjoyed this. Um, my main question was regarding cell specificity because we recently um, uh, published a reporter system which was based on Cas9 guide RNA transfer, uh, in which our donor cells were expressing the guide RNA and reporter cells of fluorescent reporter in Cas9. And one of the kind of surprising results that we found was that we found a uh, difference of communication between cell types that we expected, but we didn't find any functional transfer of guide RNAs between HEC93 donor cells and HEC93 reporter cells. Now it's also been shown in like the, the, the Krelox reporter that whatever donor cell type you use can really affect the efficiency of your transfer. Some recent uh, publications by the Andalusia and Wood Lab show that HEC93 T cells have a very kind of unusual uh, RNA content as compared to other cells. So, I mean, it's quite a, a broad statement to say that, you know, this process doesn't work very efficiently. Um, and I was wondering whether you have considered or already have perhaps tried performing such uh, experiments with different donor cell types as well, especially for functional uh, RNA transfer. Yeah, so we, that's from where we started. So we use these primary B cells that are immortalized with, with Epstein-Barr virus mainly at the beginning. So what I show you today is mainly two nitri cells uh, as a donor, but also in the paper you will see, so um, you, you saw probably that um, we, we invest a lot of time on um, using the EVs from the microNA, so from the LCS and characterize them from those. But I have to say, yes, yeah, so we use only those, those two donors. Any more recipient ones, but, but yeah, only those two. And sorry, in your experiments, anyway, uh, the re delivery of the cargo was uh, was uh, low, right? So was well. So the reported activation percentages were low, kind of in line with the the, the Krelog system. So yes, I uh, I noticed that you also referred to our work in your paper, and I agree with your conclusion that the delivery might not be as common or efficient as certain papers may suggest, um, but. I do think it's very important to realize or like to distinguish, which has also been mentioned a few times, uh, that there might be a very big difference in direct co-culture or in vivo data versus uh, EV induction experiments, because we also find that it's far easier to see this functional RNA transfer in like a five-day co-culture than it is by yeah adding huge amounts of EVs in like single additions. 
No, for this I agree. So we don't have the capacity to do this, but I'm quite sure that the fusion I say, for example, I show you, can be easily transferred to an in vivo system. So whatever cells you want to use as a donor cells, you can you can have those cells expressing it, uh, just introducing the beta lactamase fused to the right protein, and and then you should be able to to track even in vivo uh, which so coming from those cells which cells are actually receiving it. Yeah. So we I really believe this is uh, really sensitive and allows you to discriminate which cells are getting and not. So because you don't have to lyse the cells, you will have them protected. You can check by fax by flow cytometry. Uh, you can check by micros microscopy also. This I didn't show you, but of course the cells are switching from green to blue. So you can also easily check in vivo. Yeah. Manuel, can I ask one more question on this uh, fusion assay that you have? Can you exclude that there is fusion with your uh, VSV uh, EVs with the plasma membrane? Or do you really think it's endocytosis and then endosomal escape? Because uh, maybe you should want to show some pH dependence or something that you, if you block that, that you then don't see it. Is, is that, have you done yeah, that? Yeah, I was expecting a question. I have to say I cannot distinguish. So I, I just can say that the delivery is reaching the, the cytoplasm. So the beta lactamase is reaching the cytoplasm because as I mentioned you, sure. see, the, the beta lactamase is chopping the dye. All the cytoplasm is turning blue. Okay. Right. But you see, but what you see is actually uh, your your beta lactamase is 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 fused to the C terminus of CD63, um, assuming that your CD63 positive vesicles uh, um, uh, are intact and CD63 is trafficking correctly, and you have a vesicle that has that contains and your VSV and your CD63 because you have not shown that either. But if you yeah. do that, you add it to the cells. What you show, of course, is the exposure of your C terminus of CD63 to the cytoplasm. That can be at endosomal level, after right, endosomal yeah. escape, or at the plasma membrane. I if, it's at the, if it's at the plasma membrane, it's possible that then the micronates that are delivered in that fashion, and so they're not endocytosed first, are uh, not so functional uh, as the ones maybe that escape from really from endosomes, or the other way around, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. so we didn't address this question, so I, I cannot tell you. Okay. So, you know, we had a lot of questions actually about fusion and whether fusion is important, whether there are potentially other mechanisms whereby microRNAs can exert their effects. So we know that they can also influence the innate immune responses, um, whether in the, in the endosomal compartment or in the cytoplasm. And actually, um, Maria, Maria Yanejma, are you still on? Did, I know you had some, uh, some questions about fusion. Um, I'd love to hand this over to you for, uh, for your question. Maria, are you on? I know she had to run too. Yes. yes. There she is. I was trying to unmute myself, sorry. Okay, perfect, thank you. So I, I just had a comment because we made a similar fusion with different tetraspanins instead of uh, with beta-lactamase with luciferase, and we had the same results, so no fusion events detected. So we couldn't, we couldn't see any um, luciferase or, or GFP uh, recovery by using a splitted uh, version of the molecule and, and in fact uh, we couldn't recover either luciferase activity because of uh, because uh, we couldn't efficiently deliver um, the, the, the other half of the molecule into the endosome so, so EVs are uh, in our hands, mostly taken up by endocytosis, and even though the, the the target cells express the other half of the luciferase or the GFP molecule uh, required to reassemble the the full tag, if this second half couldn't enter into the endosomal compartment, so that that is also a, a second barrier that has to be taken into account uh, when when looking at uh, this. Uh, systems, EV, EV systems. And, so, and in, in some cases, we couldn't even see sorting of, uh, of uh, esterases and, and other proteases or another enzymes into EVs. So, so the, some of these uh, methods didn't work either. Yeah, actually, we do have the same experience because before this fusion assay, um, as I mentioned, we tried different ones and with the Crelox system and also with um, 
DSP, uh, so this dual split luciferase with the luciferase and the GFP, we could never really reach the same levels that we reach with the fusion with the beta lactamase. So most likely, as I mentioned, because the beta lactamase, um, so we as an enzyme, few molecules of beta lactamase are, are enough to over time uh, chop and cleave a, a lot of substrate, whether with the other ones, uh, you just rely on a single molecule. And, and these, uh, co so for the beta lactamase, you have an amplification of your signal, basically. Yeah, but that happens also with luciferase. You also have an enzymatic activity, but in some cases, the the substrate cannot really enter the EBs or the or the endosome compartment. Yeah. So that's another uh, barrier that might be working in these uh, uh, systems. Right. Otherwise, you have to lyse the cells, but then you have the problem that they might join, fold together independently from actually um being in the same compartment let's say and then you would have an artifact okay <clears throat> so there are still several questions i don't think we're going to be able to go through all of them and i'm wondering if ken can uh, can we retrieve these questions um, yeah yeah so some of you may have found that it's impossible to actually copy and paste from the chat box we don't know yeah. we haven't been able to figure that out if anybody knows a solution please let us know but but the good news is that at the end of the record, at the, at the end of the, um, the session, I get the recording, but then I also get a transcript of the chat box. So we will have yeah. all of the questions available, um, and we're going to figure out some way of of putting those up too, um, and making sure that we try to get answers for everything, um, because really there was some there was some excellent um, excellent input here. So we'll have we'll have all the text though. So, um, so Dolores, were there some some last things that you wanted to? Uh... Yeah, yeah. I just want to add some some comments. So this this is incredibly interesting, and I think uh, stoichiometric studies on microRNA in EVs are important. They will ultimately help also understanding the biology, the transfer, etc. But each of them is limited, uh, in my opinion, uh, because the technology is limited, as we discussed uh, abundantly. Um, and I think it's important to consider. I mean, I'm not surprised that the the, the efficiency of transfer or the number of uh, microRNAs per EV population is so so small, given their size, etc. But um, in fact, I mean, the problem is that it's difficult to model uh, these in vivo and with physiological, uh, physiologically relevant process. If, we, uh, if, if the process was more efficient, can we imagine what would happen in our bodies continuously and constantly as Mikhail alluded to it? We have to imagine that even if the transfer is not efficient, it happens continuously. The vesicles are released uh, pretty, uh, pretty continuously in all situations. So, uh, the, the, so basically what we have to face is that it's difficult to model and to study uh, what's really happening. And so the conclusion should not be generalized because uh, it's, it's very um, system dependent, basically. Yeah, so for this, I agree. Um, I mean, it's difficult to uh, also because we, so from our in vitro model to assess and to, to then move, move it to an in vivo situation. So, but as I mentioned, my message would be, uh, there will be for sure most of the microRNAs uh, released from any kind of cells that are not enriched in EVs and really few of the microRNAs so are small that is actually enriched uh, and, and reach high level. So it's more likely that those microRNAs that reach high level in EVs are functional, that's not all the other ones. So that, that was my point, because um, from really reading some papers, looks really like that every microRNA is transferred to any kind of cells. That's, that's definitely not true. Uh, I, I fully agree with that, Manuel, and I, I can see that maybe your title was a little bit born out of frustration of the first experiments not working. Yeah, but uh, it's a good thing that we, we put some nuance into that, and uh, definitely that the fusion assay will be uh, will be used by a lot of people, I'm sure. Thanks. Very good. All right. Well, I think we've had a, a very nice discussion here. And again, many thanks to Manuel and Michiel for joining us. Um, I, um, I, I look forward to 
the responses that we'll get on YouTube as well. So we're gonna edit this and put it up on YouTube um, as soon as we can. And we will do our very best to also incorporate the, uh, the questions that we could not get to today um, to simulate some more discussion. And maybe we'll see Maybe we'll see more about this in the pages of the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles sometime, sometime soon. Maybe we can even have, a, have a, 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 another friendly uh, discussion there. So we'll see, and um, thank you. Thank you all for joining. Um, it's been a real pleasure to, to host this session, um, to have such a nice uh, civil and productive debate. And um, we look forward to, um, to seeing you all sometime soon, perhaps at the ISEV meeting virtually, uh, but eventually we'll all be together again in the same room, I hope. So thank you all. Thanks Dolores for helping out. Um, and I uh, hope everybody has a great rest of the day, night, um, wherever you are. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks Ken. Great. Thanks Dolores. And Bye. 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 Yeah. Bye. Bye everyone.